During one of my years as a university undergraduate, I shared a room in residence with a theological student. Our common bookcase, which we made use of, held his volumes covering Old Testament history, Hebrew systematic theology, along with my texts on physics, mathematics, and engineering subjects. Oftentimes, I would take one of my friend's books from the shelf and skim through the pages, partly because of curiosity, but chiefly to ascertain what theologues were expected to study. Amongst the works which were assigned for reference reading was a volume entitled, No Other God. I cannot recall the author's name, or remember very much about the volume's contents. But I feel the title, No Other God, is an appropriate theme for this sermon. In the passage of scripture which I read, there were these words spoken by Paul to the people of Athens approximately 20 years after Christ was crucified. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. The Greeks, whom Paul was addressing on that occasion, were intelligent, intellectual folk, versed in the arts and possessing a knowledge of science. They were patrons of literature and proficient in the methods of waging war. The Grecian religion at that time subscribed to no doctrinal system. Rather, it was based upon polytheistic ideologies influenced by romanticism of neighboring non-Aryan peoples. Their form of worship was Olympic in character, whereby homage was paid to various gods and goddesses, representative of many moods, the elements, the planets, and even human passions. But Paul was clever enough to perceive that the Greeks, anxious not to offend the sensibilities of a god they may have perchance overlooked, had discreetly inscribed a tablet with the words I repeated a few moments ago. On an occasion when I visited Westminster Abbey in London, as I entered the door, I saw a group of men and women standing near a bronze plaque set in the floor of the magnificent edifice. Beneath this plaque were the remains of a soldier, name unknown, who had paid the supreme sacrifice in the war of 1914-1918. Just as the folk who stood by the resting place of the unknown warrior were doubtful as to his identity, the Greeks were uncertain of the validity of their god. It is significant that Paul, who had been named Saul at the time of his birth at Tarsus, for a considerable portion of his life doubted the existence of a living God. This was a pity because Saul, in Hebrew, means ask of God. Yet the full realization of this did not become apparent to him until that day on the Damascus Road, the Heavenly Father entrusted to him a commission. The word commission has its root in the Greek idiom, commissus meaning a matter entrusted, which was the consequence of Almighty God's revelation to Paul. The story of Saul's conversion tells of his eyes blinded by the radiance of the Holy Spirit. It might truly be said that Saul, who became Paul, was blind to the truth and did not know God until his sight was restored in the home of Barnabas. 
Similarly, as it was with Paul, so many of the world's peoples today suffer the cataracts of indifference and worldliness. However, something very fundamental in the character of the Christian church is that its members have come to know God and his realness. There is no suggestion of an unknown God to this fellowship of believers, and Paul, in his letter to the people of Ephesus, tells what the meaning and the power of this community of believers really mean. He related in personal terms of what God was doing in the world at that time. This is a portion of what he said. You must have heard how God allowed me to understand by giving me a direct revelation which he centered in Jesus our Lord. We are meant to hold firmly to the truth, live life with a due sense of responsibility, make the best of our times despite all the difficulties of these days, just because we recognize that God is the supreme power over all. Paul thus implied that by knowing God, we will grow into personal maturity through experience of trust and concern for our fellow creatures. I would like to believe that the challenging message brought by Paul to his Ephesian listeners could well be termed a Christian manifesto. The Bible opens with the words, in the beginning, God. Each day, each hour of our lives should open with the same words. We should be thankful for new beginnings and go on from newness, unhampered by the restrictions of failures or fear. Old things are become new, and all things are of God. Jesus said unto Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. In contrast to the conception of God as he existed for Abraham, Moses, and Isaiah, we possess the knowledge of a known God as revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. Ye who have seen me have seen the Father. Jesus' life and teaching emphasized the reality of a living God and that faith in such a God was a living fact. How important that faith really is. How seldom that faith is demonstrated, even within the Christian church. The incident was told of a Negro pastor who one day had called his congregation together in the church to pray for rain, since the country had suffered a considerable period of drought. The land was dry. The crops were dying. As he looked down amongst his congregation, he noticed the lack of something which he drew to their attention. Brethren, he addressed them. You have come today into this church to pray for rain. But ye are of little faith, for none of you have brought even a raincoat or an umbrella. Faith and trust in God is imperative and very necessary today. Throughout the world there is ferment of a revolutionary nature, social unrest, political intrigues, and economic dislocation. Men have lost faith in the active and controlling purpose of God at work in human affairs. Those who know, however, 
the real meaning of Christian fellowship and stewardship are not discouraged by cultural and spiritual failures. On the contrary, they are confident and reassured, moving forward with unhurried but steady pace, encouraged with the knowledge that Christians of our day are quite capable of doing what Christians did in the troubled days of Paul. This is because they know the secret of the transforming power of the church and that God's own work will be complete in God's own time. Today, as we repeated together a prayer, we beseech the Heavenly Father that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us honestly ask ourselves how much each one of us is contributing by witnessing and stewardship to ensure that God's will is an accomplished fact in our own community. If we subscribe to the principles of the holy vows and promises made on the occasion of baptism, it should not be too difficult. What about this God of ours during the summer months? Do we place him in the category of the unknown? when we travel on holidays, shutting him out with the feeling that in due time we can come to know him again once we return and resume our regular church-going habit? That is the real test. And it's a serious concern of all. With enough of the bounty of good things and wealth, many have too little of the personal practice of belief in Almighty God. Some people who try to live without knowing God have failed to acquire the peace within themselves, which is a witness of the Holy Spirit acting in the souls of mankind. If we believe in God, we pray to him. Does God answer prayer? Most of us believe he does, although he does not always answer in the manner we would wish. Generally, he answers the petitioner, if not the petition. The story is told of a young lad who lived in Carthage on the north coast of Africa, bordering on the Mediterranean Sea. This boy had met companions who are influencing his life to the point that his mother had practically given him up. He was a troublesome boy. He was his mother's constant worry. One morning he mentioned to his mother that he had decided to go across the Mediterranean to the city of Rome, a city whose reputation had been spread far and abroad, an unsavory reputation. So his mother knelt in prayer that day, praying that God would deter his son, her son, from going to this city which she felt would ultimately lead to his complete downfall. At that very moment, her son was on a ship proceeding to Rome. As the years passed and the boy grew, he met a theologian, a man who had a great influence on his life. This theologian, St. Ambrose, spent many months and years in passing on to the immigrant from Carthage 
his knowledge, telling him of his own interpretation of the scriptures and trying to indoctrinate him with the good life. This boy later became St. Augustine, one of the great church saints and leaders. We should not expect God to do everything for us. The Heavenly Father rejoices when he knows that his children are self-reliant and courageous and faithful. We must not consider our prayers mere words spoken as by the person Ali Baba in the tales of the Arabian Nights, an open sesame, the magic phrase which will shower upon us God's blessing at will. The God we know is very near in times of trial and tribulation. Incidents will occur at times which may leave us bewildered and stunned. Such misfortunes are experienced for a purpose, and only God knows why. Oftentimes, such misfortunes may be turned into something beneficial. Through all our troubles, we sense the presence of a real God who cannot use us unless we know the sympathy won by pain and the experiences which break the spirits of some and invigorate the souls of others. There are some minority groups who claim there is no supreme being. These individuals, who choose to call themselves atheists, exist in a restricted and limited world, deserving the pity and sympathy of true believers. They, too, worship an unknown God, although if this were even suggested, it would be vigorously denied. Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, once said, there is nothing which we can imagine that cannot exist. These unfortunate, spiritually impoverished folk have set up a God which is expressed by their self-centered, opinionated ego. Happily, it is possible to bridge the gulf of emptiness which surrounds them. This can be bridged through reason and by example and objectiveness. Why these very people, even though they want an affidavit from God stating that he exists, are enjoying God's sunshine, the rain, the gentle wind, and the glory of nature and the green of a leaf or the beauty of a flower. We are conscious that a large portion of the world's population still worship unknown gods. The countries of Africa, India, China, and the islands of the Pacific when one hears of good news, it is natural to tell it to friends and even strangers. In like manner, the true Christian is eager to pass on the message of a real God and the teachings of him who made this God so real to us and to those who lived before us. The chief mission, or rather commission, of the church is to proclaim the gospel. That was our Savior's request. Are we making diligent use of the means of grace by personally supporting this great mission, both materially and by praying for its success? We have received from the Lord something which must be shared by others, and this gospel is what binds together all denominations despite doctrinal and confessional differences. The diverse parts of the church may appear to be as far apart as the poles, but the possession of a common gospel and hope of salvation causes differences to disappear. The foundation of this great commission ignores the lesser and important things. It is the church of the living God, the known God, the God of Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, our God. <laughs>